Let us pray. We thank you for the privilege that you have given us to draw near into your presence. Thank you for the treasures that are therein. Thank you for the access that you have granted it. And we pray tonight that you stretch forth your hand and do your goodwill in Jesus' mighty name. We pray. You may be seated. God bless you. I'd like you to turn your Bible quickly with me to the book of Acts of the Apostles, chapter 9. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 9. Those of us that are hooking up with the conference online, you are welcome in the name of Jesus. Acts chapter 9, beginning from verse 1. And Saul yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord went unto the high priest and desired him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether there were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And he, and as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly they shined around about him a light from heaven, and he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou? me and he said who art thou lord and the lord said i am jesus whom thou persecutest it is hard for thee to kick against the pricks and he trembling and astonished said lord what will thou have me do and the lord said unto him arise and go into the city and it shall be told thee what thou must do. Hallelujah. In the book of Matthew chapter 17, precisely from verse 13, there was a great trip. Jesus moved from east to west. And while it was east, he said nothing until they migrated to the western part of Israel, when they came to um, Caesarea, a province that had a governor called Philip. And this Philip happened to be a civil engineer. And when he was appointed tetrarch of Caesarea, what he did, given his background, was that he began to renovate the city. It was on the strength of the renovation that he brought to the city that the city was renamed after him, Caesarea, after the vision of Philip the Tetrarch. Now, Jesus didn't say anything until they arrived at Caesarea. Then Jesus began to administer a questionnaire. And the subject of the questionnaire was that he wanted to find uh, the public perception of his personality, whether or not he had communicated his divinity effectively. This was Jesus that was not concerned about what people felt about who he was. Suddenly, there was this interest to understand what people felt about him, what people said about him, what people felt he was, what people felt he was on earth to do. And he began to administer the questionnaire and he said, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? 
Well, if you administer a questionnaire and the scope of administration is wide enough, you are likely to get different kinds of responses to the simple questions that you are putting forth. And in the case of this experiment, uh, there were three options of who Jesus was that came from, <laughs> from the crowd. First of all, many perceived him to be John the Baptist because John the Baptist was the one that came and pioneered the message of the kingdom. Even though many prophets before John the Baptist had seen that the body of God and what God was actually doing was that he was trying to set up his kingdom upon the face of the earth. Many prophets designed that, embedded in the prophecies of many great spokesmen of God, you could see that their heart was able to articulate the fact that the objective behind everything that God was doing was to establish his kingdom. But it was John the Baptist in his time that uh, the message of the kingdom was pioneered as the very epicenter of God's enterprise. And the reason for which John the Baptist was greater than the previous prophets that proclaimed the kingdom before he showed up was because he was that prophet that was privileged by position, by situation, for him to behold the kingdom arrive upon his proclamation. And when we say that he beheld the kingdom arrive, he saw Jesus, an expression, the compendium of the kingdom being displayed in his own generation. So he was not just a prophet that spoke. He also was privileged to see the reality of what he spoke about, uh, therefore giving him the privilege to understand the texture of what each prophet proclaimed. John the Baptist was a preacher of the kingdom. And if you check your Bible, you will find out that the message that Jesus preached throughout his ministry was the message of the kingdom. I don't have time to take you on a journey to the book of Acts of the Apostles, and I will show you the material, the capacity building material that Jesus used to educate the first set of apostles that he was co-opting into kingdom business. The subject of the seminar for which he invited the apostles to come participate were things pertaining to the kingdom of God. I know you think that the emphasis of God is prosperity. He wants you to prosper and be in health, even as your soul prosper. Unfortunately for you, that scripture that you normally quote is within the conclave of what we call an apostolic salutation. Do you know what a salutation is? When I come to your house, I say, hey, are you guys doing well? Are you okay? And people think that the body was captured within what was a salutation. Meanwhile, the emphasis of what that man of God had to deliver to us was how that he wanted us to concentrate on the subject matter called the truth. And the truth happens to be different from that which is true. It's a different paradigm that that man was bringing. That was the burden he came with. And that salutation he gave was, he was hoping that at the time that this letter will come to you, that you'll be well, you'll be okay. It wasn't a revelation he was sharing. It was a salutation. <laughs> May the Lord give you understanding. Now, so Jesus, the subject, the substance of what he preached was the message of the kingdom. And the message of the kingdom talks about the dominion of God, how the dominion of God finds expression, how he shapes our civilization in the world of men, how he shapes our hearts and makes us functionaries to serve the will of God as it is designed from the perspective of the king. And that was why they felt it was John the Baptist, because he was another kingdom proclaimer. Hallelujah. You know, some other people felt that Jesus was Elijah. Elijah was a corrective prophet. He was raised at such a time when there was so much iniquity in the landscape and the nation that God by himself crystallized in order for him to showcase and try out um, heaven's perspective as it has to do with men. God, in bringing government to these people, decided to First of all, start with them by introducing a law, a law, a law. That was his first way of ex exercising government over his people, right? So in those days, are you still with me? 
Meanwhile, in the New Testament, the subject matter doesn't change. God is still trying to establish his kingdom, but you see, the operating system of the New Testament happens to be grace, but the subject matter is still kingdom. Now, so in the Old Testament, uh, the Israel was supposed to be a nation that was held up under the government of God, under the authority of God. And unfortunately, Israel turned to Berlin. God had to send the law enforcement agent at a time where Israel had forgotten her roots, her confidence, her defense, her, the reason for her peculiarity was all forgotten. They were like other nations. And God had to send a plumb line, a law enforcement agent in the person of Elijah the Tishbite. His ministry was a plumb line ministry to bring an entire nation back to repentance. Because of the peculiar nature of the era in which God had released him into ministry, he was forceful. He was a strange kind. And the authority of God was strong on his life. And when they saw Jesus born in with the zeal of the house of God, people discerned Elijah in him. And some said he was, he was, he was Elijah. Meanwhile, Jeremiah was raised into ministry at a time when Israel had utterly backslidden. And the risk of preaching during when a, a people have backslidden is that for every prophecy you bring from God, the people will feel irritated since they are no longer under the government of God. And you stand a chance to become a victim of your prophecies. Hallelujah. A victim of your prophecies. It was because Jeremiah was afraid of ministry, given that the generation he was going to be preaching to was a rebellious house, that God now gave him some special, special anointings. He said, do not call yourself a child. See this day, I have set you above nations. I've set you above kingdoms. I've, you know, so God gave him authority over territories, authority over kingdoms. And the way Jesus preached, for instance, are you with me? All right, so some, some men of God came to Idahosa, Benson Idahosa, and they told him they wanted to invite him for a conference. He said, what's the theme of the conference? They say, the glory of, of God. That's the theme of the conference. So the, the two ministers that came to present the um, invitation letter, they were still present when he now to the secretary, dial this number, zero is, that was when GSM came out, you know, um, zero is zero, something, something, something. And when they called the number, the secretary gave him the phone. He put it on speaker. Then it was IBB that was president. He said, Mr. President, this is Benson Idahosa. I heard that you appointed three people into this office, that office, without consulting me. Say, oh, we're very sorry. The reason why we, were, we uh, did that was because we considered this, we considered that, and we felt that it was. So your considerations were right, but the error is that you didn't consult me. All right? Uh, so, the general said, well, we'll not make this kind of mistake subsequently. Please pardon us, pardon us. He said, okay, we are praying for you, Mr. President. He now told the people that brought the glory invitation that this thing he did now is glory. <laughs> now, let me explain. You are not with me. Let me explain. In Bensonida Idahosa, we had a man that had authority from God over kingdoms. Do you understand that? Over what? Nation. So if God wants to shape something in Nigeria, it doesn't go to the president. It goes to the man that he has given authority over, over. So it means that the authorities of the day had to listen to him. That was the kind of thing that God had to do to Jeremiah in order for him to be a spokesman in a time of rebellion. And when Jesus spoke, they saw the authority that he was carrying, that the kingdom he spoke for 
was not of this world. So he was not afraid of Herod. Do you understand what I'm talking about? Because he was over it. And so people discerned Jeremiah. These were wonderful observations. But unfortunately, the answers were not consistent with the reason for which Jesus sent out the questionnaire. The reason for which Jesus sent out the questionnaire was that uh, in his time of intimacy with his father early that morning, his father had revealed to him that he just whispered to somebody and revealed who Jesus' identity was. So if you check the feedback that came from the first administration of the questionnaire, you will know that the person that received the revelation of who Jesus was was not in diaspora. So Jesus decided to reduce the scope of the administration of the questionnaire and say, who do you say that I, the son of man, am? That was when it became clear that the response that was needed here was not a response that was captured by intelligent observation. It was a response that was a result of a revelation. Because as close as Jesus was to them, the essence, the personality, the reality of Jesus could only be decoded by a revelation. And when there was silence round about, the one that had the encounter, who was not sure it was God that spoke, now developed confidence and said, okay, since I've observed that the response didn't come from, it may be that that faint perception that I received might be what Jesus is asking about. And that's when Peter spoke up. He said, you are the Christ. You are the son of the living God. Jesus' response to that disclosure was that, in fact, in fact, it was on the strength of this great confession. That's what I call it, the great confession. Because the proof that the church is still present is that men still make this great confession. Because the moment this revelation came, Jesus began to speak about something he never spoke about in all of his ministry, which is the church. The revelation of the church was not disclosed from the mouth of Jesus until there was a revelation of the Christ. And so it was after this revelation came forth that Jesus began to speak about the things that brought him to Caesarea. That the same way Philip the Tetrarch was constructing the city and remodeling the city, that he himself was in the business of constructing a spiritual structure, a spiritual structure that will be wonderful enough for him to possess in order to fulfill the counsel of his father upon the face of the earth. That great revelation never came until a man tapped into the economy of heaven and downloaded a personal revelation of who Jesus was. In fact, Simon, as his name was called, according to the naming ceremony of his parents, would have borne that name Simon forever. And he would have never known that he, in that building that Jesus was going to put together, he was going to be one of the stones that Jesus will use in constructing that spiritual architectural building that he wanted to plant in the earth as a body he will have to possess from time to time to do the will of the Father. It was in that revelation that Peter now had the revelation of who he was in the scheme of things that God was about to implement. That means you never know who you are from the standpoint of your immortality until you tap into the frequency of the revelation of Jesus. When he entered into that revelation, his own, his own personality within the context of that which God was doing became clear. He said, and now thou at Kepha. And upon this revelation, I will build my church. Nobody asked him about church. It was a hidden insight in his heart that was triggered into manifestation 
when someone captured what? The revelation of who Jesus was. The deity of Jesus can only be understood by revelation. And what the church is here to do, the church is the platform that is created so that the revelation of Jesus will be dispensed again and again to a world that is facing severe crisis in the earth. If you go to the book of Revelation, you will notice that Jesus was walking in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks and the interpretation from Revelation chapter 1 verse 20 of what the seven golden candlesticks were was that the they represented the church. So if the world is ever going to encounter the reality of Christ, the one of the, uh, the things we hold in store as the community called the church is that we are the ones to dispense the revelation of Jesus Christ to our world. And just in case Jesus is not seen, it is because we answered the questionnaire and failed. Because once upon a time, he will have to come to you and ask you, who do you see? If there is no great confession, and the great confession is born out of what? Now, so for instance, when you hear David saying, the Lord is my light and my salvation, it was a revelation of Jesus that he had. And he was able to give Jesus a personalized name that was consistent with the experience of him that he had received. So if there's nobody in this place that has a walking revelation of Jesus, it means Christianity is dying because in your lips, we will never have the great confession. Exactly. You know, I read the scripture to us just now and that scripture is in the book of Acts chapter nine. The scripture speaks about a certain zealous man. Once upon a time in Nigeria, there was a certain governor that rose up. The state that he provides governance to happens to be a very large state. And because the state was large, it means that the concerns of that state are many. He left all the concerns of the state in terms of striking balances, in terms of bringing management, in terms of you know, setting up infrastructure to better the life of the people, in terms of driving the millennium development goal. He left all of that. And he felt that the most strategic thing to do, given that he's now in power, was that he should set up a bill in his national assembly to regulate the church. And part of what was captured in that bill was that there should be no night prayers. Hallelujah. Now, so he was, are you with me? You're not with me. <laughs> Your spirit is not sharp today. So, what exactly was that governor looking for? What can help me? Was looking for what? Oh, oh, you're not with me. I went too fast for you. Those of you online, follow me in the name of Jesus. Listen. What he was looking for was authority. There were several things he had in mind that he wanted to do but there was no authority for him to do it. So he wanted to create the premise to legalize the treachery that was upon his hand. He was looking for what? Authority. Meanwhile, what that governor looked for that he did not get because he, 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 he failed in the adventure. What that governor was looking for, Paul secured. He had already gotten letters from where? from Jerusalem. Those letters that he got from Jerusalem, oh, you're not with me. Now, okay, in the book of Acts chapter nine, verse one, it say, and Saul yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord. So even before the issue of letters came, the guy was breathing out threat that I, I will be the one. I've heard you sing, I, me, 
I will. But you see, as without letters, the best he could do was to threaten. Because he didn't have the authority to implement the things he was, he was saying he would do. But I tell you, he was sure of what he wanted to do. But the only thing lacking was that he, there, there was no what? And it, it was not just threats. The, the, the nature of threats was also defined. The kind of threats he was giving out were, were threats of slaughter. You see, it, okay, in the rules of engagement, if you're fighting wars, for instance, nations have come together and they sat down and said, okay, when we fight wars, if we must fight, there are rules of engagement. So we're trying to, they try to make war, make war decent. The first rule of engagement is that Wait for your opponent to shoot you first. I have a lot of friends in the military that have gone for all kinds of wars and they have recited the rules of engagement to me many, many times. And those soldiers from the Nigerian army that went for these wars told me that if you kill somebody under the rules of engagement, their spirit will not appear to you. That means you are delivered from, from feedback. I don't know whether I'm making sense to you, but don't kill anybody. I'm just telling you the people that kill eh, and kill in the military. They said to me that if you kill under the rules of engagement, the spirits, spirits don't appear to me. Are you, are you with me? Now, so part of the rules of engagement is that uh, you wait for your opponent to strike first. Second thing about the rules of engagement is that you don't kill women and children. Is very critical. You don't kill what? Now, let us see the scope of the vengeance in the heart of this man. Verse 2. And desire him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of the way, whether there be what? Men or? Now, his vengeance doesn't respect the rules of engagement. I know you have seen the sight of a policeman catching a man, beating him before, and all of that. It's, it's, it's not to, have you ever seen a woman being beat like that? It's, a, it's an abomination. But this guy doesn't have any regard for abominations. The, the letters he was looking for are authoritative passes that gives him access both to men and women. That if he found any one of the way whether there be men or women, he might bring them. In what form will he bring them back to Jerusalem? Wow. This was the level of vengeance that was crystallizing his heart. But he could not implement it because he didn't have the authority. And so he sought what? Letters. So just like that governor had an intention in mind, and we were not privileged to know the intention. But his, his intention was subtly built into a bill that he needed the left hand of Satan to craft. Satan lended him his left hand to craft that bill, hoping that at the event of the passing of that bill, he could do great damage and then he will become a pioneer. And then other governors will now see his example and begin to take the same kind of dressing. And before you know it, to pray to your God will become a, 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 a crime against the state. And God saw where that evil man was going. Because, and I came to tell you that the story of that evil man has not yet been told to the letter. There's still an aspect of the story that will be told subsequently in the name of Jesus. Yeah. So this guy went and he got the authority that he needed. So there was nothing that was stopping him. Are you with me? Having gotten this authority, a man can no longer stop him. Having gotten this authority, uh, the best you can do is pray. Because according to the ruling powers, he has been given the vested authority to carry out this assignment and he's been waiting for it with passion. And he was gliding down to Damascus with all the vengeance 
in his heart to translate his mishap on the church so that when any, after what he will do, it will be difficult for somebody to say, I gave my life to Christ. Men could no longer hinder him. People with good intentions could no longer stop him. There was nothing that was going to stop this guy. And what happened was that Jesus occasioned a revelation. <laughs> he occasioned what? A revelation. He occasioned a mighty revelation. He was close to Damascus very close to the place where he will begin to effect the kind of vengeance that he has premeditated and he had all the powers to exact this kind of fury. Hallelujah. Suddenly, he saw a light. Now, in this kind of a story, you will think that when God wants to intervene, he will appear in form of a hammer. It was light. It was light. And he fell from his horse and fell down. And the light was so bright that it made him blind. Are you with me? So bright, he became blind. And when he became blind, then he knew that what collided with him obviously was an authority that was higher than his own authority that he went to secure. And that was why when he addressed the personality that was behind the lie, the first question that he asked was, who art thou Lord? He added Lord because only one stronger than Jerusalem has the capacity to stop him from that kind of a mission that he was intending to execute. It must be a lord, a monarch, one whose throne is higher than high. And it was just the light of his countenance that shone upon him, just a light. You know, Jesus moves with a brilliance, there's a light an energy that transmits on the in his presence and it was just the light of his splendor that touched this man that had human authority and he discerned in the light an authority that was higher than the letters that he secured from jerusalem do you realize that this was the last time those letters were mentioned the moment, it, it seems when he fell, the letters fell with him. I speak in parables. I speak in parables because what I see is that the light of God is coming to shine upon Nigeria and some people on some horses who fall. Who are thou, Lord? It was a Lord that he saw in the light. Uh, it was a Lord that he saw rising from the light. Before and when such a thing happens in battle, you are going to conquer. You are going to conquer. Then the captain of the other side, he cuts you down. There's only one possible way that thing will go. Your head is the first victim of the impact that is about to come. So he, he greeted, he saluted him bountifully. Who are thou? Lord. And this great Lord that was stronger than the letters from Jerusalem did not strike him. He was bigger than the little terrorists that he was. He said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecuted. You know, this time there was no question here. <laughs> he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard to kick against the barbed wire that any
anything, we set this thing up from eternity. You want to quench it from time. Every attempt you make in time to quench something that is eternal in scope is like kicking against the barbed wire. It's hard. It's hard. Oh, I, I see so many things going on. Killings here and there. All kinds of things. Human beings are determined to make a statement. Jesus is saying it is hard to kick against the barbed wire. It is hard. After that small lecture, that was a parable. That was a lifetime lecture. To a young terrorist seeking to make a name to destruction. Seeking to waste people in their prime. And then a majesty appears to him. The reason why he did not die was because he disarmed and saluted properly. And instead of death, he gave him a parable. It is hard to kick against the barbed wire. And then the mysterious thing that Jesus did was that instead of him to communicate to him directly, because after he gave the parable, Paul now said, what must I do? He said, okay. This one might be useful. All right. So go into the city. This is Jesus speaking. And it shall be told thee what thou must do. It means the mission with the letters had ended. And he was a man that was always looking for authority to, to, to give credibility to his intentions. Now that he has been arrested, this new authority that he has found, which is superior to the letters, he's willing to carry his own message again. So there were, Paul was a slave of messages. So if he meets an authority, higher than, he, he, he has enlisted. <laughs> what must I do was his question and the monarch said I am pressed for time go into the city it will be told there what you must do it means that part of the revelation of Jesus that the man contacted was going to be given to another fellow so the first revelation that Paul was forced to receive was the revelation of the body of Christ that the body of Christ was mystical. That he was interfacing with Jesus just now. And Jesus was saying, part of what I want to tell you, I have told somebody already. Go to the city. So it became clear to him that he was not capable of destroying the church because the church had a mystical connection. The person that was going to be the messenger to communicate the mind of God about this brother was not in the scene of the encounter. But he was in vital linkage with his master. And the voice of the monarch had appeared to him. He said, go into the city. And it shall be told you. It shall be told you. It shall be told you. What thou must do. Do you realize that Jesus didn't change his name the way he changed Peter's name on the account of revelation? He didn't have time for that. But it was when he went into the city. The brother that came with the voice of God had his name changed as part of the revelations they came to download. Because until you encounter Jesus, you don't know your essence. You'll be running errands for various authorities. But upon stumbling upon Jesus, what happens to you is that you see yourself. You see your errand. You see the assignment that you were apprehended to prosecute. Go into the city. Your life has no meaning if you have not yet encountered Jesus. The revelation of Jesus is the starting point for every form of apostolic labor. Anything that will bring the kingdom of God and the civilization of God upon the face of the earth must begin with a revelation of Jesus. The questionnaire will have to be retrieved and God will have to endorse your response. 
who the men say that I, the son of man, am. So he went into the city blind because he was led by the hand. Whereas he came with a company of foot soldiers who were co-terrorists on the mission. But when they went to the place of destiny, it was only him that was there, blind. You may think we are a crowd, but before God, you are an individual. You might think we are a community, but before God, you are standing alone. And when the real matters of destiny come, the crowd you came with will fizzle out. And in the fullness of time, when the best moments of heaven come upon your life, you will be the only man standing. If God likes you, he will isolate you quickly and make you understand that uh, the, the, the cloud that comes because of the multitude is no defense whatsoever. The Bible says, and Abraham was alone. Abraham, he was alone. The Bible says, and Jacob was what? And God knows how to isolate you. And because he has some specific words that he wants to dribble into your heart. It will be the matching orders for the next phase. It would be the things that will give you a definition and an essence. Go into the city and it shall be told thee what thou must do. Turn your Bible with me to the book of Acts of the Apostles, chapter 22. It shall be told today. It shall be told today. It shall be told today. Acts chapter 22, beginning from verse 12. It shall be told today. This is the experience. He met a rigid master and he collided with the light of his countenance. But the words of the master was in a simple disciple, a simple devout man. And if this great functionary of the kingdom was going to understand the meaning of his life, the reason why he went to the university, studied the law, the reason why he came out as first class student and was isolated to do masters under Gamaliel. The reason for everything was going to be found on the lips of a normal man. A normal man that has had intercourse with Jesus. A time will come where our nation will need to seek secrets. The secrets that will unleash the potential in his foundation. And that we need men that have heard from Jesus. And that's the only way we will be free. Because the light of his countenance that is about to come is going to strike many people from the from us back. Yes. And on the ground, their decorum will change. Their response will change. It's in this mighty visitation that God will redeem our land. And one Ananias, a devout man, according to the law, having a good report of all Jews which dwelt there, came unto me and stood and said unto me, Brother Saul, first thing is what? Receive your son. At the same hour, I looked up upon him. So on the strength of that guy's command, it was as if the power to give sight was in his hands. Brother Saul, that was the first time in his history that he was called brother. Called brother to people that he was going to kill. He, he was still trying to understand. But even though he was seeking understanding, he was already accepted. His name was noised in the companies, among the company of the righteous, that one of your brothers is coming, even though he had the face of a terrorist. They knew. His heart was changed. And it took a lot of courage for this man to call him what? Brother Saul. And then this man that he looked upon, all right? The man that gave him back his sight did not look spectacular. The man looked ordinary. Then Paul began to understand that in the heart of the people of the way was a possibility of access 
that made them see and know great and mighty things that normal mortals will never get to know. Humidity came upon him that moment. Imagine somebody walking to you and say, Tony, receive your sight. And instantly the ability to look upon him was given to you. He was home. Next verse there. And he said, the God of our fathers have chosen thee. This is what the, the next part of the message that Jesus wanted him to, <laughs> to receive. The God of our fathers has chosen thee. That thou should know his will. One. That thou should see that, uh, and see the just one. That's two. And thou should hear. Watch. Watch from his mouth. You would think that the number two is not necessary. Know his will. And what? Hear the voice. No. No. If your ministry has to do with persecution. If people are going to contradict you. People are going to stand against you. To make you look like a fool. Jesus will not give you half the package. He will give you a full package. You will have to look upon him. So that in, when, if, if the lashes, the strokes of the cane are coming upon you, you will know that you saw him. So you will know his way. You will see the righteous one and you will what? You will hear words. These are the three things that God does to a man. That, a, that such a man becomes a kingdom functionary. He opens his heart like a sultry. And he causes him to be able to discern his will. Then he comes to you with an encounter. And gives you the possibility through your spiritual senses to look upon his glory. I've had encounters many times. And the Lord came. He didn't say anything. He just smiled. And I was enjoying the encounters. I didn't know that many years from that time. I was going to be persecuted for seven years. But you see, in the midst of the persecution, I could not deny that I looked upon him. Woo! So I was always faced with a choice. Either to go with the one I know in the privacy of my spirit. Or to bend according to the will of the circumstances and the situations. Before Jesus makes you a messenger to proclaim his kingdom. He allows you to know his will. He allows you to see his form, his shape, then you now hear words from his mouth. And that is the way the new form of letters will be given to Paul to advance his destiny. The reason why he went without looking back was because he knew his will. He saw the righteous one and what? He heard. There are three things that must happen to us in this conference. You will know his will. And you will see the righteous one. Oh my God. And when you hear words of instruction from his mouth, you will know it is the monarch himself that spoke. And nothing will make you look backward. This was what was required for the making of the apostle of the next generation. The first generation of apostles, they ate with Jesus, they lived with Jesus. The next revelation uh, generation of apostles, they were born out of the real season. So Jesus will have to appear to them in spirit. And this appearances has three parts. He appears to you to make you know his will. He appears to you so that you can see him in view of the oppositions that will come so that you will not deny him. Then he appears to you so that you can hear words from his mouth. Any man that says he's an apostle and has not seen Jesus it's a liar. And very soon, demons will reveal the fact that he's false. Because you cannot begin apostolic ministry in this era without Jesus speaking to you mouth to mouth. He said, brother Saul, the Lord Jesus that you saw on your way to Damascus, he sent me. Oh, my Pelikasuma Lia Kambela Kura Baski Bakanteli. You know why I believe we are related spiritually? You. When you were ministering, you still remember in Ibadan, you were ministering. And the weight of the glory was so much. I sat down. 
I sat down and suddenly the roof of the building was removed. I know you don't know that. It was removed and there was light. There was great light. And as the light began to wane, I saw Jesus standing before me. And Jesus began to speak to me. You were ministering, you didn't know, but Jesus was speaking. 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 He spoke to me. It was during, then we now met again where? In Uyo. He was ministering again. I came and sat down. What Jesus began to speak to me in Ibadan, he didn't complete it. He was ministry again, and Jesus came to me again. Jesus said, e, e, e. The light was intense. And he pointed me and said, I, I, I have come to set you free so that where I am, there also will my servant be. You, you know, that his words was a, in a particular context. That morning, my wife called me and said, He saw me in a place. I was in a class office. I was looking out, but I was with my computer. And I wanted to go out. It was when I wanted to go out that I discovered that that glass office was a prison. That she doesn't know what it is. That same evening, while you were ministering, Jesus, I was meditating on the glass office when I entered into the, the meeting. And Jesus appeared again. And he said, I have come to set you free. So that where I am, there also will my servant be. It was when he said this, he said, rise up and resign. Because I'm going to journey with you to the nations of the world. You know what? There's so much a pastor can tell you. But the pastor cannot tell you what Jesus will tell you. You will hear words from his mouth. It's when you hear words from his mouth. The authority with, with which those words are spoken is much more than the one your father ever used to speak because it's going to define your life for many years. The revelation of Jesus. You don't have an identity if you have not heard from him. I was in, in Rehab Hotel in Dubai, in Sabka, and, and I was up there, up there. I went to the restaurant and I asked them to give me food. And, and when they brought the food, the rice was green. Green, have you seen green rice before? It was so fine. I, I felt like I was hungry. But when I took the first spoon, the taste of that thing was like Maggi. So I vomited it. And I told the waiter, what is, what is this thing? And the waiter is, was an Indian, the law. The law now told me, this is drug. Drug. That means it's not about the taste. It will, it's drug in your body too. Actually, I'm not sick. I want food. I want food. I, Jesus. Well, that's how I left the dining table. I was angry. I wasted some of the money I should be using to survive. When I got into my room, you know what? Jesus was there. So I knelt down. And he began to speak to me. He said, the youth the youth deliver the youth from destruction and i will open the gates of nations to you that's the first one he told me right i didn't know that my labor and that's 2009 i didn't know that my official secretary in youth ministry was for 10 years after that encounter i had in dubai the next encounter was the one about what was standing in front of me was Uyo. When he said, resign now. It's time for us to go to the nations. That means I was faithful with the youth. Hey. <laughs> Jesus. Resign. I want to take you to nations. And all in all my prayer in recent time, I would just, I would just see myself in Zambia. See myself in Botswana. Hi. See myself in South Africa. Because you will go in the spirit first before you go in the natural. He said, Brother Saul, the Lord that appeared to you, he refused to speak to you right there because he wanted you to come to me. This is what he intends that you will know his way. 
we, we have three prayer points this night. Can you pray? Because these two nights, these two nights, these two nights, the meeting will continue beyond the meeting. And as you go, expect Jesus. No true apostolic, apostolic invention takes place without Jesus coming personally. I'm talking about, he doesn't delegate angels to do something. No, I'm talking about Jesus. 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 I'm talking about the revelation of Jesus. That's the only way strong men can be raised. People that are stronger than the sin in the land. Stronger than the poverty in the land. Stronger than the death, the killings. Stronger than the kidnap. Men that will come to establish a new shade of government through which the hand of God will be ex extended to our generation. It comes by the revelation of Jesus. Three prayer points. You need to know his will. Because if you don't know his will, you are a slave. You are serving the letters from Jerusalem. Until you meet the ultimate authority, your life will be drifting like a canoe that is stuck in the waves. You will be a victim of circumstances. You will be a victim of situations. Except you hear his voice. We want to pray. Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. The time that Apostle Pa Ertin spoke about has come. He said that it's a revival that is coming and uh, this revival is pungent in holiness and righteousness so much so that the fabric of the Nigerian nation will be touched by that move of God and a nation that was once attributed to corruption as the headquarters of corruption in the world will come under the weight, the influence of the glory of God and suddenly, suddenly that same nation shall be known for righteousness. That same land will be known as the headquarters of the move of God. It was Pa Elton that said that Africa is a corn and Nigeria is the trigger. There is something that was obtained to come from Nigeria. He sent me that you may know his will. He sent me that you might see the righteous one. He sent me that you might hear words from his mouth. The time we have waited for has arrived. Men of conviction are about to arise. Prophets of the first kind. Men that have looked upon God's shape and heard his voice. I say to you tonight, receive your sight in the name of Jesus. Receive your sight in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Your name is ever great. You are the wisdom before I began. You reign forever, your name is ever with you. You are the wisdom before I began.
Oh, 